Okay, so who's here for the first time? Anybody? I don't know. Wow. Every time, there's always a handful of people. So this is Yeti Zen. Let me tell you a little bit about who we are and what we do. We have a few different arms of the business. The first is Yeti Zen Speaks, and it's a series of events we do. 50 to 100 events a year, about 20,000 game developers come out, primarily educational events. We also do hackathons, workshops, seminars, and some of our big parties. You might have heard of us from that. The second arm of the business is a very intense late stage accelerator. We have 150 mentors, some of the biggest industry executives come in and mentor startups. Uh, we also are currently raising a fund to pair with those companies as they come into the program. And the third arm of the business yet to be announced is a boot camp. And this is what we've noticed in our community is a hunger for learning prior to being ready for the accelerator. Companies at an earlier stage who want to find out about monetization and distribution, all of these topics, they come into a very intense boot camp. So look at yetizen.com to find out more information. Uh, I'm going to first introduce our speaker in Moby. Is it Prakash, right? Welcome. Come on up. Is that a picture you took? I wish. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, hello everyone. So this is my first time at JDZN2, so happy to see all you guys. Um, so I'm senior product manager at Emobi. Uh, it's a brief intro of Emobi. Uh, we are a global mobile ad network. So we help developers like you acquire users and also hopefully monetize them. Um, so, I, so I work at Emobi. I take care of a couple of formats that helps you better monetize users and I also help uh, in some of the formats that help you acquire users. So broadly in this talk, I'll cover about some of the areas of how you can acquire users, how you can probably re-engage them, and some of the monetization techniques also. Um, quickly going on, um, and in, in case there are any questions, please feel to raise your hands and you know, let's keep it interactive. So first part, right? I mean, this, way, uh, this is the reason why we all are here. This is the most exciting part, is the whole uh, app landscape. It expected in 2014 that there will be 1.75 billion smartphone users who will cumulatively be downloading 139 billion times various apps. And those users are going to spend 621 billion minutes in this year. And, and the last most important number is $35 billion revenue is what this ecosystem offers. So this is the reason why this is the overall share, and that's why you know, all of us are here to try to get the pie of either the users or the time that the user spends on their app, or and of course the money that they spend on the app. So, um, so I'll briefly touch upon uh, you know some of the user acquisition part, the re-engagement part, and some of the monetization part. Uh, very briefly, I think uh, something that I think most of most, just a show of hands, how many of them, how many of the people in the audience have an app already live in market, a mobile app, and. Awesome. So good. So we have good mix. Oh, I see someone right off the door too. I'm not oh, you there? Okay. <laughs> um, great. So for people who don't know uh, about mobile app uh, business model, so basically we've seen uh, so bit, broadly there are two ways to make money, right? So you of course have a premium model, which is what's the most common model. The premium model is the one where the app is for free. Uh, the users can download the app for free. But as and when they want to use more capabilities or more features, then they have to pay. Um, and the paywall could depend upon either the time, it could be that the app is free for some duration and then you have to pay, or some of the features, some advanced features could be locked out behind paying, or even user experience, things like you can customize the app or the experience by paying money. So premium is what really is picking up in the mobile space. This is where most people actually make money. Uh, the paid notion, the paid notion of Downloading, you know, paying, paying for an app to download is something that's not, it used to be there, but it's not as much as it is in case of premium. Um, the last option, of course, is how do you make money is through ads. Uh, this is a very interesting model of uh, how, do you, how do you mix uh, freemium and in-app ads. So one thing key to look at is these business models are not afterthoughts. These are something that you have to think through while you're building a game or your app. Uh, because it's very really hard to actually have a Free app, and then you ask, then you pay, then you ask, then you change it to a paid model, or then you try to slap advertisements onto it. So all these things need to be thought through while you're building the game or building the app, and need to be thought through about the, during the entire workflow of the game itself. Um, the one thing I just want to touch upon, I mean, something we've seen uh, at Emobi when we work with a lot of uh, developers is not many of them actually have an app landing page. It's very surprising. Um, 
And I think uh, you know, if you have an app, and if you if you if you have an app that is already live or you're thinking of actually going live soon, having a quick landing page uh, is an easy event. It's an easy event because it hardly takes 30 to 40 minutes to actually build a decently looking landing page. But it's important because there's still a lot of conversions that happens on the desktop. Uh, so you still want to capture those users that come through a regular search who land up on their page and want to convert back into mobile. Uh, and it's also a good way, right? I mean, I'm an engineer. Uh, I think it's easy to build a app landing page to kind of gauge your interest even before writing the first line of code. So if you have an idea in mind and if you want to solve a particular problem, having a landing page, quickly getting a feedback, getting those leads is a very good way to start even before you actually write any code. And there are some interesting tools to actually uh, uh, you know, help you create those landing pages. The next part, I think this is something that uh, we've seen a lot, uh, again, when you work with developers, is global. So a lot of times, the apps that you build may be very local in nature, could be very specific to a region. So let's say there is a baseball match. You could have a app around baseball match course. So of course, users outside US may not be relevant for that. But in a lot of cases, if you have users which are global in nature, or if you have the app experience which are global in nature, it's important to actually think, how do you tackle non-English speaking uh, countries? This is an interesting stat. So if you look at the overall app revenue uh, in 2014, 43% is coming from Asian countries, 33 from North America, and 24 from Europe. So you still have a huge amount of audience out there in from non-English uh, non speaking countries uh, who you could possibly go after. Uh, the top Asian countries, of course, are Japan, Co China, uh, Korea, and China. So an interesting start about Japan is, Japan is the has the highest lifetime value of a user uh, compared to every other country out there. And it's very interesting. It's closely followed by Korea. Uh, China, the LTV of the user, the lifetime value user is not high, but you just have a lot of Chinese users. So. Uh, it's interesting, the three markets are something that you should definitely look at if you have, or if you think of an app which is global in nature. Uh, so one of the things that, uh, when you look at uh, going global, right, there's a notion of transla translation and localization. And they both are certainly very different. Translation is easy. Translation is about converting your various strings or various text that you have in your app into local languages. And I would argue that this is actually a very easy win. And you know, when you're building the game or when you're building the app, internationalizing your strings is the easiest thing that you can do. You may not convert into those languages, but at least you can be ready based on analytics. If you see a lot of traffic is coming from a different region, then you can try to convert your app and translate those to those particular languages. So uh, again, going back, there are easy tools. So don't use Google Translator to translate. <laughs> it's a bad idea. I mean, we've seen that in the past. Um, you can use mechanical terms. You can use Elans. There are a few tools out there, which is a human translation is always the best thing. You can use one sky that's in the audience. Oh, is it? Um, one sky, anyone? <laughs> Reach out to those guys. I'm sure they have horror stories to share later, but um, but it's important, right? I mean, you can translate it. Uh, take help, get it translated. It's an easy win. Localization, on the hand, is more deeper. Localization is about bringing local elements within the game itself. It's not about string. It's about the gameplay itself. It's about the characters. The characters that are there in US may be very different from the characters that are there in Korea or people that the characters that the people relate to. So localization is all about bringing the local flavor into your app. It could be characters, it could be screenshots, it could be gameplay itself, it could be of course currency if you're doing in-app transaction. Uh, what works in some regions may not work in other regions. Like for example, China, Alipay is a very prominent uh, way of you know charging users. But that's very different from how it happens in US or Europe. So localization in terms of the entire game experience is a great win. So I'm not sure if you can see it uh, on the top right, the Clash of Clans. Uh, I don't know how many of you played Clash of Clans, Supercell game. I love this game. Uh, they they recently uh, localized to Japan, and uh, they looked at. I, I don't know if you noticed the character is actually a Japanese uh, character, uh, unlike when you what you see in the English app. Uh, it's interesting to think about, but again, the thing about localization is it's a very 
uh, it's a lot of it's a lot of cost and time consuming effort. So what I would suggest is start a translation because translation is very easy to do. Look at your analytics. Look at the countries where users are coming in. If you get a lot of traffic from a specific or specific regions and you see the the engagement is low, that means users are coming in but they are not able to understand or they are not able to relate to what your app is about. Mm -hmm. So at that time, you could probably prioritize and figure out if localization is a way to go about. Um, some interesting number. Again, uh, other game of uh, Supercell called Boom Beach. Uh, Boom Beach uh, did a translation uh, to Japanese sometime back. So in the week of them translating and going live, uh, they saw 17x increase in downloads from that region than otherwise, than from their English version. Um, it's a huge number. Again, it, it just could be an outlier, but it just tells you what are the opportunities, at least what's the scale of opportunity if you invest time in localizing your app. Um, and that also resulted in uh, four times the revenue. Uh, at least what they have done, Boom Beach, when they initially did the uh, uh, conversion to Japanese, it did, this started only with translation and not localization. Then they slowly brought in the local characters. So this is the reason why you see it is 70 times increase in the daily downloads, but only four times increase in the translate in the revenue by those downloads. The next part I'm going to talk about is just just when you think global, the problem is if you are thinking of an i if you're thinking of an iPhone app or an i an iPad app, it's easy to go global because you have only one app store. You just have to build your app once and you go to iTunes store and every user across all the regions can access those apps. But in case of Android, it's actually very different because you have a multitude of app stores. In Europe and in, in US, it is primarily Google Play, but then there is Amazon, and in especially in China, Japan, Korea, there are uh, Tencent, Tencent is a very popular uh, app store for, uh, for hosting Android apps. There is uh, Slide Me, there is Oprah. So there are a lot of independent app stores, either by either by the operators, like uh, you know, there is uh, there are operators like AT and T could have an app store, uh, OEM Samsung has an app store, uh, social app store like Slide Me. So there are a multitude of app stores out there. And if you look at it, the numbers last year was about if you look at the Google Play numbers and if you look at non Google Play Android numbers, the non Google Play Android app stores were driving about two times the numbers of the Google Play App Store. So if you have an Android app, and if you think the app experience is global in nature, where users from other regions can also go off, do look at how do you go after uh, some of these multiple app stores. But again, uh, there is a cost and then there is a value. The value, of course, is you get a lot more users. The cost is all these app stores have different rules and regulations. So some of these app stores don't allow you, for example, you go to Amazon App Store. Amazon App Store requires you to use Amazon one-click pay payment for any in-app transaction. But if you go to one of the operator app stores, they would require you to use the operator billing. So every app store has some of the other nuance. Some operators, some app stores don't allow in-app transaction. Some app stores have limitation on, restriction on kind of apps that you can run. So there's a lot of work that you have to invest to actually go to multiple app store, but there's a value to it. So figure out, uh, again, based on analytics, where your users are coming from. If your users are coming from certain regions, localization and going to some of the prominent app store in those regions are also a good way to get good quality users. Um, the other way, of course, to also acquire users is the paid uh, user acquisition. So this show of fans, has anyone tried paid UA uh, to get users in the audience? Awesome. I just see three hands. Great. So, um, Everyone else is shy. I see more people. <laughs> <laughs> I know. So, and, and being in the ad, ad business, uh, ads, I mean, we have heard this case, right? Ads work well in some cases. Ads don't work well in some cases as far as UA is concerned. So you look at ads. Ads are really about using paid user acquisition. It's all about two things. Finding the right user through the ad network. And two is what is the format of the ad that you are showcasing. So a lot of times people spend a, people spend time on the networks or acquiring the right set of users. They actually spend less time trying to figure out what format works well. So there's a notion of experiential marketing and brand. For those of you who don't know, this this particular uh, screenshot is from um, so Expedia actually partnered with an Australian um, agency. So what they did is they actually set up 
this touch screen on various places in Australia where the users can come in and interact. They will just want to say that I want to travel to this place, I can interact within this uh, experience and it's all powered by Expedia. So it's a, it's a very subtle way of giving users a glimpse of what the brand is offering. So, and I think there's a huge potential of trying to bring, bring in the experiential concept into app downloads. If you want to acquire users, it's important to also figure out how do you acquire the right set of users. Because a lot of times what happens is when you spend money on ads, and if you don't focus on format, you may run a banner format, you may run an interstitial format, users may click it, but there are two problems with that format. One is the ad by itself may not give you, may not give the users a complete understanding of what the app is offering. Because if you see a screenshot, a screenshot just talks about thousand words about an image. I mean thousand words about an app. But if you look at a things like video, it talks a lot about the app. So the one problem with regular ads are it's not very informative. And two, if it's not informative and if you if a user still clicks it, there's a high chance or there's a chance that user may not even like the ad. Because what they saw in the ad was a screenshot that says it's an amazing app. But then when they actually installed it and they used it for the first time, they realized the app is not what they thought it would be. And there is a metric that you know over 70 to 80 percent of users who install the app for the first time, uh, they don't even they come back later. So it's important to get the right set of users who will continue to engage within your app. So what we believe is bringing the notion of the app that you are promoting within the ad itself is a great way to get qualified lead. So so there are two formats that are very exciting in this world of experiential ads. The first is video ads. So video as a medium to communicate a story is compelling. So I don't know if you've noticed that uh, Apple back in June actually launched this feature where you can put app trailers. So if you go to App Store, you can actually, as a developer, you can also upload a video asset. So when a user is coming to your Apple landing page, Apple Store landing page, along with screenshot, they can also see a video. And the reason they did that, and Google has been doing for a long time, is video tells a great story. Because in 15 seconds, it tells you a lot about what the game is offering, as opposed to just seeing a series of screenshots where you don't necessarily understand what the app is all about. Um, and the same format, if you bring into an ad, where if you run a video ad, as opposed to a regular image ad, it actually, we have seen that it gives you a much higher conversion. And along with conversion, we also see high LTV. Because a user is spending 15 seconds of their time watching your ad and watching what the app is about. And if they're interested, then they're downloading it. So it's a very qualified lead. So when they download it, the value of that user or the retention rate of the user is much higher than otherwise, which is the reason why we see LTV being very high. Um, this is a very... Uh, sure. So this is a very large uh, advertiser that we worked with a few months back, where they ran both regular, regular, regular ads and they ran video ads. And what we noticed is, and we also got the LTV data, so this particular game actually has a lot of in-app transactions. So what we found is users who were who were acquired through a video ad actually gave a higher LTV or higher in-app transaction value than users who were acquired through a non-video ad. The other interesting format is what we call as playable ad. So this is taking the experiential ad to the next level, right? So instead of getting users install your app, the problem with a lot of user acquisition, either paid or unpaid, is for the user to try out your app, they first have to they first have to discover your app, install the app, and then try it. What if you give a mechanism where they can try your app even without installing it? So this is basically bridging the gap or narrowing the gap between uh, offline, which is pre-install and post-install. So we believe playable ad is a very interesting format for you to for a user to understand what the app is about. So playable ad is basically a 20, 40 second, uh, 20 seconds to 40 seconds interactive ad where the user can actually see or play the app within the app itself. Uh, let's see if this works. This is a flappy word, all of your favorite ones. <laughs> it's a bubble pop uh, app. So within the app, within the game, I'm actually seeing the ad and I'm actually playing the ad. So I'm exactly interacting with what the ad is. So I know this, I know this app well, and if I'm interested, so I already spent a few seconds on it, I can then install it. So now it's much qualified late. So if I were to, so because I spent 10 seconds and I understood what the game is about, and then if I'm interested to install it, that means I know I like this game. 
Um, again, no code required. The second last part I will talk about is engagement. And since we're running short of time, quickly, um, three things to look at. One is uh, you will have users, but users will drop off. Users will drop off because either the levels are very hard or because there's no excitement left in the game. And there could be many reasons why users can leave off. So one of the, re one of the things that you should always look at is re-engagement ads. Because uh, acquiring users is costly, reacquiring users is less cost. And it's important because you already paid for that user. It's important that you actually reacquire them or re-engage them at the sooners. So things like deep linking that you see on Facebook or Google, these are things that you should definitely try out. Uh, helps you to get those users back. Um, things like push notification, again, uh, triggers and reminders. There are interesting apps where if you go based on based on the location that where you are in, it can pop up interesting triggers. So if I'm near the uh, I'm from near the ATP park and it can tell me that Max is happening and you know, tickets around. And the last is of course offer incentives, offer things like great missions reward, keep the users excited within the game. At the end of the day, we all are users, we all are humans, we all like to get excited and get rewarded by what we do. So give them great mission rewards. There are some some of my favorite apps, Survey Surfer, Foursquare. I'm a big sucker for the badges in Foursquare. So wherever I go in, I keep checking in just so that I can get those badges. <laughs> and the last part is and uh, is about monetization. And I was talking to someone in the audience before the call, before the session started. You are building an app experience. You are building an experience for the users to consume. The thing is, the way the user consumes that experience is very different at different points in time. So if I'm playing a game, I may be excited, I may be pissed, I may be frustrated, I may be super thrilled. At different points in time, I have different expectation of where I am. So when you think of monetization, either, either in-app purchase or ads, you have to think through the various movements that a user is at the point in time of the app. And depending on the, those, those point in time, you figure out different monetization techniques. So if you want to do, let's say, an ad-based monetization, don't just go after a single format for all users, right? Figure out what stage the user is in. Is the user excited? Is the user frustrated? Is the user waiting for the in a in a no in a in a game where I have to wait for the other player to finish? Am I waiting for the other player to finish? So figure out those points in time where the users uh, where the users are, and depending upon those form depending on those points in time, figure out the different ad formats or different monitoring techniques to use. So. Awesome. Wonderful. Yeah. Let's give Rakesh a hand, guys. Well, thank you everyone for being here today. Uh, let's have the panelists introduce themselves, starting from my most right. Uh, your name, company you're with. Okay. Um, so I'm Riaz Karamali. I'm a partner here at Pillsbury. And on behalf of Pillsbury, let me welcome all of you back here tonight. And um, I uh, am a transactional attorney, and I work with um, a lot of uh, video game companies and other technology companies on uh, their corporate matters and, and uh, uh, things like venture financing, game publishing deals, mergers and acquisitions, uh, all that kind of stuff. Uh, my name is Arash Kishnaran. I'm the co-founder and CEO at Limbic. Um, we are a, a small indie studio, but we have a lot of users worldwide. We're about 30 million players. Um, a mix of paid and free. We've been doing this since the beginning of the application We've been business for about six years now. Um, and we've gone from being a, a premium studio to transitioning to freemium, played lots of different models. Um, it's been a really wild ride. I'd love to share some of with you. Cool. I'm Justin Bailey, COO of Double Fine Productions. Uh, we're the studio started by Tim Schaefer. He's our very charismatic leader, um, known most recently for the success of Double Fine Adventures, which at that point was the uh, highest funded uh, crowdfunder, crowdfunding game um, about three years ago. Uh, I'm Brian Sapp. I'm uh, Director of Digital Publishing at Warner Brother Games, where I oversee uh, user acquisition, analytics, and monetization um, across all of Warner Brothers mobile games. Uh, prior to that, I was at Tapjoy for three years, um, so very familiar with UA monetization from that network perspective and now game developer perspective. Okay. Um, so, uh, one, so this is the way we're going to do it today. We'll have a couple of different sections and types of questions. And panelists, not all of you have to answer all questions, because I'm hoping there'll be a bit of a debate. Some of you don't agree with even the premise of the questions, so I'm hoping you'll say, explain that to me. OK, so to get it started, first definitions. In two or three words, 
what is guerrilla marketing and what is engagement marketing? Who wants to take that? Okay, so uh, guerrilla marketing in my mind is uh, marketing that's unconventional. Do you want me to just give like, I think mine's dead actually. Uh, I think you, you just test, test, yeah. test, test. No? No. Yeah. This one. Yeah. Check, check, how about that one? Okay. No. Um, so yeah, uh, guerrilla marketing, I, I think of it as, as marketing that's, that's unconventional. Um, it's surprising uh, and it's often very creative. Uh, so it's stuff that you will do that's out of the norm. It's not a banner ad. It's not a you know a, a campaign with videos or anything like that. It's um, a famous example that I like to refer to, and this was this is in Wikipedia as well. Uh, Mini Cooper. They wanted to advertise the uh, the new car, so they wanted to try to get their visibility in Houston, Texas. And what they did is they built a foam model of the car, and they put it on the side of the building, and people saw it and they're like, whoa, like what's that doing there? Um, they were fined by the city. They had to pay a, a, a little municipal fine, but uh, of like a couple thousand dollars. But what that got them was front page featuring on all the newspapers in Houston. So totally unconventional, right? They didn't design an ad. They didn't do anything. They just built a car and put it on the building. So I think to me that that speaks to, to what we're looking at. Yeah, the the three words I would use would be um, indie, no money for gorilla, um, and then community. Uh, engagement, basically for engagement. Actually, I, I probably shouldn't use the word to find the word. So let me go with embrace your community um, for for engagement. Yeah, I, I think I agree. I think guerrilla marketing to me is like an unconventional spend in an industry where you're going against a standard spend, right? So I think kind of like to me, like the music industry kind of defined guerrilla marketing because street teams became very effective for bands. They would uh, plaster college kids to go out to communities and hand out flyers, right? And they would use very passionate fans to market on the band's behalf. And then all of a sudden, like, it became standard to do that, and that wasn't very effective anymore, right? So I feel like guerrilla marketing is always evolving. It's like, at some point, someone sets a trend, and that becomes a, a great way to guerrilla market. And then all of a sudden, that trend becomes the norm, and then it has to keep adapting, right? So I think guerrilla marketing is just like, Unconventional and ahead of the curve in whatever industry it's in. So, question for everyone. Uh, do you think that guerrilla marketing can, uh, can target <laughs> users effectively? The right type of user for your games? I mean, I think one of the things you're trying to do with guerrilla marketing is you're just trying to sensationalize things. And so, um, when, when we kind of go about something, we want to make something that will appeal to our core. Um, but it can be a little unconventional that it actually has a chance to appeal to people outside that and get picked up as something new and innovative. Um, so I think maybe you can with like some of these marketing firms that are really established and say you know, they have a formula to grow marketing, but I would argue that that's exactly the, the wrong point is that it's, it's, it's unformulaic. And it, as soon as it does become a formula, it's like a perfect market. Everybody will swoop in because the whole point is we don't have money and we need to get it noticed. And that's why we use, to some extent, some stunts. So is there any type of uh, guerrilla marketing that requires any kind of research and, and, and thinking through of, of who you want to reach and how, and how and why? Well, what I would say is that when you do guerrilla marketing, um, you should have a plan in place to transition to engagement marketing. So, um, you know, there's this thing in film that's like you want to get, when you see your teaser uh, trailer and stuff, you're just trying to gain exposure. You just want people to know about this film. And then you start to get near the film, you start to bring some plot elements and teach people about what the film is. You're trying to actually convert them to kind of a, you know, to, to buy a ticket and go watch it. Um, it's the same thing with, with a marketing plan like this. If you're doing a guerrilla marketing plan, you don't want to just like have this flash, kind of flash in the pan that is then gone. You want it in a way that everybody's then being funneled in that you're engaging them to retain them. Do you need a strong social pr uh, presence for guerrilla marketing to be effective? Uh, and this is for anyone again. Um, and how is that in contrast to say engagement marketing? Do you need a strong social presence for that? I think Arash, you guys have a very large sort of uh, base of people, developers who kind of follow you guys as well, right? Yeah, so so podcasts and whatnot. We've done a bunch of different things. I mean, early early on when we developed our first game, we were at the uh, University of California in San Diego, UC San Diego. Um, and we used a lot of our identity as students to market the games. So we did a lot of unauthorized flyer posting throughout the university and tried this game by university students. 
Um, and that ended up being a, a nice move because college students are some of the most influential people. Um, they're trendsetters, they're, they're tastemakers. Um, and so they would tell their friends, and their friends at Stanford would hear about it, and their friends at UCLA would hear about it, USC would hear about it. And so we got a lot of just viral spread through the exact age demographic we wanted, which was that um, you know, 18 to 24 uh, range. So, so that was really powerful. But um, you know, I think uh, keeping some sort of identity helps, um, like Sana mentioned. So uh, personally, what I've been doing is, is running a lot of developer podcasts um, that we, we just talk about kind of you know, issues that we're talking about here. Uh, with other developers do interviews, things like that. And that helps us build relationships that lead to things like cross-promotion, um, doing you know, in trading with other developers, things like that. So uh, I certainly think fostering a community helps, um, and it's something that you can do really at no cost. Putting a podcast up doesn't cost anything, talking to other developers doesn't cost anything. Um, so the first thing we do when we meet a developer that we like their work is we just reach out, we have lunch with them, we have Skype calls with them. Um, it's really a big community of friends. Um, and that, in a sense, is, is not really guerrilla marketing in the classic sense, but it definitely gives you a platform um, to be able to, to engage a lot of people and a lot of users. And Double Fine has a pretty large social platform too, but more from just people following Tim Shaper. Uh, yeah. So can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, and so uh, the community is central to us. It's the one thing that actually made the Kickstarter so successful. Uh, it's pretty interesting, actually, because if you look at the history of the studio, um, you know, Tim had left Lucasfilm Games at the time, was even LucasArts. Uh, and then you had Psychonauts, and then they had a publisher, and then you had Brutal Legend, and you had a publisher, and then you had the THQ games and a publisher. Um, and all along the way, there was a community just following Tim. And Kickstarter, well, crowdfunding in general, gave us a chance to actually reach out and for those people to directly fund and interact with the game. And you know, we didn't even have a game at the time, which later would cause some problems. Um, but you know, it was just like, hey, do you want to fund a game that Tim Shaper makes? And then that's when we got, you know. Crowdfunding up till then had been a few thousand people and maybe a few hundred thousand dollars. And in one day, we got a million million dollars. Um, and then we still actually have the most backers among any video game project, um, which is by far the most successful vertical. Um, so, you know, one thing that Tim is just inherently good at is retaining a community. And he just naturally wants to, to go out and reach out to that community. Um, and and that's, I think that's essential to the success of, of double fun. So, you know, looking at between guerrilla and engagement, we primarily engage in the engagement portion of it. Um, that doesn't mean, like, if you know Tim Schaefer, you know, he can be saying he can do things that are kind of funny, and that's kind of where the guerrilla stunt thing happens. But I would say a lot of stuff probably happens that's not really just thought out, it just kind of occurs. And if you're not Tim Schaefer, what should you do? <laughs> Uh, I would say, get some Tim Schafer. <laughs> <laughs> Wear a Tim Schafer mask everywhere. Plaid <laughs> beard. <laughs> okay, so how do you uh, plan and measure the effectiveness of girl marketing? Right? Or is there any measure, or do you just say, hey, that was fun? There was it, a lot of people followed. It can be hard. So, I mean, getting direct tracking of how many users are coming in from that campaign can be a challenge depending on what you're doing. So, with the, um, the flyer posting, you could do things like uh, uh, have a special URL that you're feeding people through and then having that link to the App Store. So you could use that as some sort of attribution uh, uh, system. I mean, it's, it's, it's much more difficult than like a banner ad getting clicked, right? There's not a, really a strong infrastructure for saying, well, how many people saw that hot air balloon with a giant sheep attached to the side of it? I don't know. Um, and more importantly, how many of them actually downloaded the game after seeing it? Um, but you can certainly kind of see the effect if it's a really significant viral campaign, like if you did some big viral thing in Japan and then suddenly you know, your sales in Japan increased uh, for, for no other apparent reason than sometimes you can attribute it to that, but it really depends on like how much is it moving the needle. Um, because it may just be a small part of your overall strategy. So unexplained spikes yeah. can be... Uh, yeah. can I just, uh, I think, like, it's also a question to me, like, uh, how effective is guerrilla marketing for games, right? So like, I guess what I mean by that is that like, and what is girl marketing? And it's keep going back to that, but um, there's actually like a, a network rematch. Do you guys remember rematch? They'll basically have celebrities tweet for you about your game, right? Like, is that guerrilla marketing or is that just straight up marketing? Like, um, you know, so you can create these kind of social sensations uh, via money, um, but like like guerrilla marketing, like how are we going to make a, a video that goes viral? And like, what will that do for my game? Is it right for my game? You know, I think these questions almost need to be asked if you're a developer with no money and, and you're like looking at guerrilla marketing as the way to have success with your game, 
it's almost like, is it right for my game? Is my game like a PvP game where I need to hit, um, you know, a mass amount of users? Is it location-based? Do I need to focus on certain region before I uh, launch worldwide? Um, I think there's just a lot more to it than just guerrilla marketing versus marketing. Because um, it's all tied together. And it's all, you know, am I spending money or am I doing it on my own, right? That's right for my game. So, the fun question. Most memorable guerrilla marketing campaigns you've ever seen on mobile? Um, so back in, oh gosh, when was this? This is like, this is old, but I thought it was really clever. Um, back in, I think, I want to say it was around 2010, 2009. Um, there's a company called NG Moco who like, was one of the early big players in the space. And um, they had a game called Rolando, which was this like ball of roll around and this adventure game. It was kind of expensive. They wanted to make it kind of like the next Mario on mobile. They were selling it for, uh, I think it was $2.99. Um, they, they had a lot of trouble getting, getting uh, users into this game because, of course, advertising in general for paid apps is a difficult and uphill battle. Um, but they did something really smart. So they, they had some extra artists, they had a couple extra programmers. They decided to write a small game that would be really attractive to people to download. And they made a game called Topple, which was this game where you'd stack these like cool blocks with faces on them. And you tried to make the, the tallest tower you could. And it was really cute. It had these faces and like stuff with Topple, and like their faces would get all scared as they're falling. Um, it <laughs> screenshotted really well. Uh, but it didn't really monetize or anything. It was a free game. They put it on the store for free. But this thing, like, it took off because it looked good and people wanted to play it. And at that time, there weren't that many free games. Um, so they used it as an awesome funnel that they built in. I think they only spent like two or three months building this game um, to, to actually push a lot of users into Orlando, which is where they did most of their monetization. Um, so it was kind of like, well, we're good at building games, so let's use games to advertise our other games. Um, it was a really well thought out strategy for such an early time in the market. Didn't Tapjoy do something similar when you were there? A lot of different reach apps to like build a base. Yeah, well, it's um, yeah, uh, I know a lot of like indie developers in the game and larger developers, even Greek, have started this where they're now trying to create viral apps or casual apps that will shoot the top of the charts to stay there, and they'll they'll put their developers on it. Um, who let's say you were working on a you know, hardcore card collecting monetizing game and you need a break from that grind. They'll put them in this lab and just try to have them create some super casual games that is then just a tool for UA, right? Like it's never going to monetize well, um, but we're going to pump users from that game into our high monetizing games. Um, but uh, I think another good example of uh, guerrilla marketing is Mailbox app. Do you guys remember when Mailbox app came out? Um, and I know it's non-gaming. I actually couldn't really think of any gaming ones. Um, but um, you know, they came out with an article in TechCrunch about how great this app was, and then they basically wouldn't let people into it, right? Like, you had to sign up for a waiting list to get access to the app, and it's like, you know, no one wants to be part of the club that everybody's part of, right? So, like, everybody was just, like, hammering to sign up for this list and wait. Um, and it was just a great, like, marketing move, basically, with holding people and having them sign up for a waiting list to get into the app. I think that's what LinkedIn's doing with those uh, posts you can share with your network. They're not letting me in. I really want to get in. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> we well, actually, we do do that games like Nintendo when they don't have the consoles, and then you know the PS3 when you can get it. And yeah, uh, iPhone six. I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't know if it was actually purposeful, but yeah. Well, with Apple, I think it was. Yeah. Is there a danger to that? If you try that. Sure, there is. You're turning away your users. <laughs> yeah, you're you're limiting a potential user that would download it. They, they can't download it at the time. Right? Yeah. Any uh, any legal dangers to that? To and to, uh, to to basically creating this uh, this wall and people can't actually sign up. Uh, as long Rejected as you're people. not discriminating against a protected category, I think you're okay. <laughs> 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 okay, so. Let's maybe shift gears a little bit quickly to, to legal ramifications, right? Sure. So, um, uh, legality of guerrilla marketing efforts. What, what are some ways we need to think about it so that we keep, keep it kosher? Yeah, no, that's important. I mean, just because it's guerrilla marketing it doesn't mean it's last minute and half-assed and not thought through. I mean, it's, it's really important to, to think through these things and think through what the you know, implications of whatever you're doing are um, there? You know, there could be legal issues. Of course, you know something like what you're talking about with the, with the Mini Cooper on the building. You know, it, it's good to understand what those issues are. Okay, it's it's basically you're violating a civic uh, code and you'll be fined 500 bucks. Okay, fine, you'll take that on. But on the other hand, what what Sony uh, did uh, a few years back and they. 
basically populated the streets with people with a new Sony phone and, and asked them to accost strangers and say, would you take a picture of me? Um, and then the, you know, the guy took a picture with the phone and then the uh, actor basically was saying, oh, how great the phone is and didn't realize that it was a, you know, a Sony uh, contractor who's hiding the merits of this new phone. Well, the FTC is going to get pretty interested in that. <laughs> um, so, and, and that's not, you know, that's not a governmental authority that you want to flout. So you have to so think about it. Like <laughs> <laughs> right. What's, is, is there like some, some uh, matrix you have in mind that you talk to your great clients, like you know, double clients, three of your clients, saying, hey guys, this is what you need to think of before you give me a call on specific. <laughs> well, I mean, you just have to think of what could go wrong, basically. Could it cause a riot? Could it cause, uh, you know, <laughs> put someone in danger? Um, you know, they, they, these things these things happen, and especially in other countries. The laws can be more draconian and more unpredictable than here. So if it's going to be in, in another country, you have to think even harder about it. Yeah. Does, does anybody remember the whole we for a we like scandal that happened? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, that was pretty bad. So like yeah. uh, we's were hard to get hold of. So the ties into that question before. And so a radio station was like, hey, if you drink whoever drinks the most water and then urinates the most, we will get a you know free we too. Um, and the thing, that, of course, they didn't know is that no, without urinating. You, yeah, had, you, you had to drink without going to the bathroom. Oh, it is. Okay. Oh, Whoever no. holds it in the longest, and that's the most dangerous thing, because so it killed the woman who did that. Yeah, actually, that, that yeah. I didn't know it actually killed him. So. She yeah. beat to death for him. <laughs> yeah. And she was, she was getting the weed for, you know, she wanted to get the weed for her kid, so it was, it was, it was awful. But yeah, that's a, that's a good example. Um, any IP issues with Gorilla Market? Yeah, I mean, I think, not so much on the patent side, but in copyrights and trademarks, you need to be cognizant of it. For example, you could, if you have a campaign where you're asking folks to take selfies or take pictures of people, um, you know, if they're wearing uh, shirts with logos on them, you need to find a way. If you, I mean, if you care about this, which I, th I think you should, you need to find a way to screen those out because you're not, um, you, you're, you know, otherwise you're you're going to be using other companies' logos in your in your materials. So. So uh, thing, things like that. That's you know that's one example. But yeah, all 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 the usual legal issues can rear their ugly head. Things like the ice bucket challenge. Any possible issues that could have happened? Um, yeah, of course. Uh, so it, you know, we're getting into getting into um, employ into workplaces. Um, that, you know, that's that's one thing. Pressure being put on people to do that, and and uh, you know, are, are they getting paid? Are they getting paid overtime? All you know, all those, <laughs> all, all all those things. I mean, there's there's issues to, to think about in these things. Hope they got hypothermia. <laughs> yeah, problems there. Anyways, um, so so guerrilla marketing and engagement marketing. A little bit of looking at the connection there, right? So, either in your companies or across the industry, have you ever seen those two work well together? Some examples of that. No? Because <laughs> it sounds like for Double Fine, it's, it's, it's more oh, of an increase your funnel. I didn't realize you were actually addressing that. That's no, I, I just uh, based on what you said earlier, I mean, we, I we, our marketing is like all non paid. Like, we can't afford any marketing. Mm -hmm. So that's like everything we do has to be either community oriented um, or it has to be some kind of funny stunt that will you know, mm -hmm. grab people's attention. Is um, that the case for you too, Arash? Uh, yeah. Do you I mean, paid marketing? We, we, we've done some paid marketing. Uh, most of our apps have been premium until recently. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's just, it's not a, a non-starter to advertise for paid apps in general. But um, on the engagement side, I, I see them as separate things. I mean, the gorilla side, that brings in new users and engagement is kind of how we keep them and how we retain them and how we help them become evangelists for our products. Right. So um, one of the things that I find to be uh, crazy that some developers don't do is sell t-shirts. So it's, it's basically free to sell t-shirts. You can find someone to, and, and don't do the Zazzle stuff because that stuff is junk, but you can get a good printer to print a good quality shirt on like an American Apparel type of thing. Um, and, and you just sell them at cost or slightly above cost. And you're basically giving people a way to be reminded of your app every time they open their closet, <coughs> when they wear it, their friends are asking them, hey, what is this thing? And, and if somebody's wearing a zombie gunship t-shirt, someone says, hey, that's, that's cool. What is zombie gunship? Um, that's, that's a free app. Someone just gave, gave a, an endorsement for do you, do you release that at certain levels in the game, or just the, the shirts? Um, so the we, shirts just, we just sell them in the shop. So there's a little message that pops up mm -hmm. once in a while. It's like, hey, do you want this game? Go buy a T-shirt. Um, but we also give them out to some of our most dedicated fans. Um, people that are kind of whales uh, will get free shirts sometimes. Um, we find it just an awesome way to empower people to to, to spread the word. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, we always did that with like uh, Kickstarter campaigns. Like, you should always have a shirt because it's it's really easy. And like a lot of times, people will pay the hundred dollar team to get that shirt because it says, "Hey, you know, I was in this exclusive period of time and supported this, uh, you know, a backer." And so you make it you know special for that uh, for that time. And um, you know, one of the things you see obviously is when you just factor in all your costs into it, um, so that. No, you're not incurring too much expense at the end that would take away from the game, but like every single tier that you sell that has a t-shirt on it, you know, is actually the delta is more money for the game. Perhaps a title that ties to your question, Kim Kardashian, the glue that is Gorilla and engagement. What do you guys think? Yeah, I mean, we were talking about that earlier. It's like, is that Gorilla marketing? Um, you're basically tying a celebrity or an IP to a game and I can tell you, that, that game was Stardom, right? Blue came out in Stardom, which was the same game. Didn't monetize well. I mean, sorry, it monetized well, but they had trouble getting users. Okay, how do we solve that problem? Let's tie Kim Kardashian to Stardom. It's called Kim Kardashian, and then boom, it's a huge hit, right? Well, they certainly do buy traffic as well. So. Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, the game's doing like 500,000 a day. Um, uh, yeah, so they do pay DOA, but I mean, I think, <coughs> I think the App Store is getting more and more competitive, right? Um, UA is getting more and more expensive. We do paid UA. Uh, we have a, you know, Injustice is a top grossing title, so we would do paid UA around that game. Um, and that game makes really good money, and we're having trouble finding, you know, uh, margins on our spends, right? Um, and so what's happening is the App Store is getting more and more competitive. You need, it's almost like getting to the point where you need IP or something to set you apart when we're talking about user acquisition at the scales that we're talking about, right? Um, we're talking about 100,000 new users a day versus, you know, how much can guerrilla marketing pull in? I don't know. Depends on how viral it goes. Depends on the game. Um, but it's extremely tough. You look at Tiny Co, right? Working with Family Guy. Um, you know, uh, Ludia works with IP. Um, Pocket Gems, you know, like these companies are looking for IP because they see it. Even these companies have had a lot of success. The UA is getting so tough that you need something to set you apart in the app store. When that game comes out, people recognize it. Right? One thing Gorilla about Kim Kardashian was they made it where you thought you were sending a tweet in the game, yeah. but you're really sending a tweet to everyone of your Twitter followers. Yeah. <laughs> so then like, a lot of people didn't know they were actually sending real tweets. You're exactly <laughs> right. Yeah. So they kind of hacked the system a little bit. Yeah. So, you brought up an interesting point about scale. For those who actually don't do any paid user acquisition, where does the scale come from? Um, I mean, that's why we don't do it because it's like to compete in that arena where you, where you acquire users. You know, you're competing against you know people that have a huge war chest, um, which we don't have. And we found that unless you spend you know a certain minimum, um, it's just not going to be effective. So, how do you scale the real market? Oh, uh, you don't really. That's all featuring. Um, I mean, that's yeah. We we leverage everything we can. So um, I guess one thing we could do is like, um, you know, we've good relationships uh, with a lot of uh, the other indie developers that we hope co-promote the games just because we like the games, not because there's any kind of Gamergate conspiracy going on. Anybody's heard of that? Um, and then you know, Jack Black like his friends with, with Tim, and so we would leverage you know that. You would do a voiceover, and Elijah Wood has done voiceovers and stuff for us, and. Um, we just try to take all the personal connections that we have and leverage them as much as we can. And I think that the, the difference between you guys and a lot of other folks who do things like featuring is, uh, there's a featuring and then you actually stay and, and, and on those charts there's value, there's no spike and then a, a drop down. And I think that goes towards Arash, maybe some of the things you were saying earlier about things you do to engage people once yeah. in the game. I think it's right. important to, I mean, if there's no retention on a game, no amount of marketing or Apple features or moon writing is going to make a difference, right? So if you have users that come in and they go right back out, you can't retain them over a certain critical period, like seven day retention or even longer. Um, you really have to look at like game design issues at that point. It's not a marketing issue. Um, I wanted to touch on, on other plans for people with the money. So. Uh, there's a, a game called Leo's Fortune that got an Apple Design Award. And one of the interesting things they did, um, amidst a lot of you know banner ads and, and all this type of marketing spend, they built, uh, I don't remember how much they spent, but they got like a small film studio to, to do this Rube Goldberg video where it was this ball going through this really complicated machine where all this stuff happens. And at the end of it, it, it turns into the character for the game. 
Um, and this, this video got several million hits on YouTube, and they went from, uh, I don't remember how many downloads it was, but they increased their downloads from a large number to a large number that was like 50% more than that number before it. Um, so it was, that was something they didn't have to pay for, I mean, they just put it on YouTube and people shared it because it was a cool video. Um, so there's op opportunities for that if you have a creative team, um, which most game studios usually do, uh, to, to kind of come out of the game design side and say, well, can we build something that's um, uh, interesting for, for people want to share this on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook kind of perspective. And that's kind of what Everplay tried to automate a bit, but yeah. not to that level of success as some With the, uh, the recording of the yeah. gameplay. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, that's another way we really engage users. And so one of our games is a strategy game, Tower Madness, where uh, in order to beat the levels, you have to you know, build your towers in a certain way. Um, so we use things like Everplay and Camcord to um, let players share their strategies. And that's that's been a really big thing because people are proud of their achievements and levels. So um, they'll share it to their other friends, and it'll help them both engage themselves with the game, and, but also they'll, they'll bring other players um, that see their strategies and want to improve on them. <coughs> that's been effective. So a little bit about the numbers. I know, you know your perspective is it's all about being authentic and don't plan it too much because then you end up uh, uh, actually not making it any, it's, it's, when it's too planned, it's not real anymore, right? And I know you, you also had a similar perspective to that. But, you know, the business side, the ROI, the P&L, you know, there's, there's a lot of people who don't have that much money to burn, you know, like, and have very little. Um, and while they all do want to trust you guys and saying, yeah, let's, this is the way to go, how can they think through if something is a good idea or not from that P&L and ROI perspective? Yeah, I mean, there's another question that I kind of jokingly was like, we'll wear plaid and get a beard um, and act like a shaver, but... Yeah. But it's worked. Well, the, 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 it's one of those things. It's like if you see somebody that actually has been very successful at kind of doing the viral, the guerrilla marketing thing, it, it's align yourselves with them because you're not going to instantly become someone like that. So, you know, we have our own program. It's called Double Bind Presents, where basically indies reach out to us and then we introduce them to our community and we give them tips and, you know, we try to help them basically get exposure. Um, and of course, like, like for us at least, uh, in, in our space, our space is not the mobile space, but um, you guys probably know a lot of the famous Let's Players, like Mary Cube and um, a bunch of other ones that, um, the Yogscast guys and stuff. And it's like, right now, people are reaching out to them too, to, you know, to figure out how, how can they, um, you know, get more exposure. So, you know, I'd say that, and I'd say it's a, you know, it's a building process. Um, we have indies who work with all the time, they're trying stuff that's crazy. Um, there's some of those guys, um, you know, some of the people that are VC backed now, uh, that are friends of ours, you know, they got their start and the way they got their funding was they were trying just crazy things. And I think that's one thing about, you know, real campaigns, it's, it's kind of more of an attitude um, that it is that idea of just trying these crazy things and then when something works out and so you get a thousand views or 10,000 views, you know, that's some place to build and, and having a plan to build from there. And then the next time, hopefully it's 10 times more and just keep at it and you grind it. Any questions from the audience? Who lets have a few more and I can keep going. Do they really want to be at the game? Okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, say as, as you're an indie, you don't have money, um, and you do all the, you know, the right marketing things. You set up your Facebook page, you, set, you know, you talk to the press, you get some great press, uh, you get reviewers, you know, YouTube reviewers, community reviewers popping out, I don't know, or requesting copies, you give it to them, they all give you good reviews. Um, uh, you do everything right, you have your landing page, uh, Facebook page, yada yada, um, uh, what is it, uh, your, uh, your, your, your you got the tactics Twitter covered. thing, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. everything. You do it and everything's great, but it doesn't translate to sales. And despite the fact that all the um, reviews were awesome, mm -hmm. what else is there to do and what are you missing? Yeah, I would, I would try to spell one thing, which is um, people always equate press and Metacritic to sales. And that, Not think, Right, exactly. That, that connection is gone. Um, and if you do look at the press and, you know, you look at those less players are much more effective at driving uh, traffic. And especially with way, in our world, you know, we do a lot of PC Mac Linux. Um, we do some mobile stuff, but like Steam has just changed their model, where basically now it's basically curator-based. And um, so you now have a lot of those Let's Play people and people that have huge communities around them picking the games, and that is so much more important to drive sales. Um, like, if everybody heard the Yogg's Cast thing, the Yogg's Discovery, and they were getting, um, they were getting a little bit of flack from that in the press, uh, they were doing a game called Space Engineers, and 
generally on Steam, you won't see things in the top 10 unless it's either a new release, on discount, or it's featured. And usually it's a combination of those that add to it being there. Um, and the Yogscast guys were able to keep Space Engineers up in the top 20 for like a month. That's just unheard of. And the only thing that changed there was that they had reached out and uh, uh, to the Yogscast guys to cover them on their channel. So I think that's it's getting really interesting. You have these these curators who have their own communities that you can leverage, and you're going to need to leverage them mm -hmm. to be successful. Yeah, thanks. The game is actually on. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm referring to a game that's actually on Steam right now. Yeah. Uh, we didn't we didn't reach out to those folks, but uh, all the other you know Steam communities came out and reviewed the game. Uh, we'll see what happens when it goes to mobile. Yeah. When did you guys release it? Uh, about. Um, Two months ago, uh, June, uh, June, July, uh, right after July, uh, July, July eighth. Did you go to console? To, to Did what? you go to console? Uh, no. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Last question from the audience. Is anyone have one? Is there a uh, best time of the year to, to launch a game? You know, like films have a seasonal Christmas. I, I can. Or... I can tell you what the worst time to launch a game. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is Christmas. Like, don't, we don't touch the month of December at all um, for updates, for major campaigns. It's just way too noisy, way too crowded. I wouldn't also launch games around Apple events, um, just because, again, you're going to get hit by a lot of... Uh, a lot of people spending a lot of money. That's exactly right, yeah. yeah. So so only, like, news that you want to bury, like, if you're, like, legally obligated to publish a story on something. It's actually, so look into this. This actually happened in the last Apple event. There was a company that had an apology for... Kind of misogynistic thing the founder said. They did it like right when Apple went outside. Watch out for that though, because Intel just got caught to um, the Friday 5 p.m. release, and they just got they got toasted over. It, so. uh, other times, bad times to release Monday, Fridays are bad, and Thanksgiving. Yeah. Uh, if you're doing mobile, you're gonna and like app, you're talking to Apple, inevitably they're gonna put you on a Thursday. Um, so you'll see a lot of launches happen around that. That's when the features come out. Although there was one really, I don't know if it's still a good tactic, but it was like around the Christmas, if you got on the list and you got blocked for a little while. Yeah. They, they used to freeze the app story as like the 21st through the 28th or something to freeze. That was awesome. They were like good in the charts. But yeah, they changed in recent years. Like, every year it's different, so you can't really plan around it. But um, yeah, Christmas is a really tough season. I actually like doing it in January. Um, uh, I'll let you in on a little secret. So a lot of kids get like gift cards from their parents as mm -hmm. gifts. And, and they're spending them in January. So nice. be ready for that. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Great discussion. Let's go on.